and welcome to another Coffee and Hard Tech, a digital program with the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, we're really excited to be here again today. And I'm Jen Edgington, Curator of Education at the Kenosha Museum campus. And with me as always is Doug Damon, our Manager of the Ed Department and the Curator of the Civil War Museum. And we're really excited for our special guest this week. Um, with us is Cecily Zander. So Cecily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys, I'm excited to be here. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure, I'm um, finishing up a, a PhD at uh, Penn State here in State College, Pennsylvania, um, where I work on the United States Army in the 19th century. So I cover 1835 to 1885. I look at the regulars and the kind of politics um, surrounding territorial expansion in the army. Um, I grew up in Colorado, so that's why I've sort of tried to combine my love of the Civil War era with, um, you know, the history of the American West. So that's what I really try to do um, in my dissertation. So I'm here at Penn State now. My undergraduate degree is from the University of Virginia. And uh, I got to study with great Civil War historians there and here at Penn State. So um, I've been a, a beneficiary of um, sort of a great Civil War education. And uh, I am sort of really looking forward to finishing up the dissertation um, and, you know, looking for my next step. I'm not sure what it'll be uh, yet, but, um, you know, just really enjoying this period of writing and research and, and being, you know, a scholar um, full time, which is, is a nice job to have. <laughs> <laughs> so, so some of your work that your, your, your most recent work covers the Grand Review. Mm -hmm. um, for those of our viewers who might not be that familiar with what the Grand Review was and when it happened, could you summarize it for us and um, fill us in as to what exactly happened during that two-day event? Sure. So um, people tend to think about the surrenders at Appomattox and Durham Station as this kind of um, final point uh, of the Civil War, but actually a, a lot of soldiers pointed to this event called the Grand Review as a kind of final moment of their Civil War service. And it's a two-day victory parade um, that occurs in, in Washington, D.C. at the end of May 1865, so May 23rd and May 24th. Um, the first day of the parade, the sort of troops of the Army of the Potomac, so they're under the command of George Gordon Meade under USSS Grant, march through the Capitol um, in front of hundreds of thousands of spectators. Um, and then the following day, the troops that had gone on William Tecumseh Sherman's march to the sea and the armies of Tennessee and Georgia marched through um, the Capitol. And, um, you know, this is a widely covered event in the newspaper, um, much more so than Appomattox, because if we think about chronology, um, Appomattox happens and then Lincoln's assassination occurs and that then dominates the news cycle. Um, so actually the Grand Review is seen much more as this kind of triumphant conclusion to the Civil War, um, in which some 150,000, if not 200,000 troops participate, um, you know, and, and again, hundreds of thousands of people come to watch. And then it's reported in newspapers across the country, it gets major, you know, two page plates in all of the, um, you know, the weekly magazines. It's a big deal for the Civil War generation um, and something they return to as a point of reference when they talk about Union victory and its meaning. So it's a really, really cool event. Um, it's sort of hard to get a sense of um, how big it was, but for the Civil War generation, they would never have seen this many soldiers gathered in one place. And, and indeed for much of the world, um, it was a, a sort of a, an event that people were paying attention to. Um, certainly foreign governments had their representatives there and all sorts of, um, visitors and luminaries and diplomats are writing back to their, you know, uh, governments and saying, these guys um, are pretty impressive. Um, and what they achieved is pretty remarkable. So it's a it's a really, really cool event. Um, there are some photographs, but of course, it was constant motion movement. So they're pretty blurry. But it's, a, it's amazing to see uh, Pennsylvania Avenue would have just been shoulder to shoulder with uh, Union soldiers. Um, and you know, their commanders. And, and that's the thing people come out to see. They come out to see Custer and they come out to see Sherman and, um, you know, um, Oliver Otis Howard. I mean, they just, they're trying to get a glimpse of these celebrities. Um, and Andrew Johnson and the cabinet are in a reviewing stand watching the parade. Um, yeah, it just brings together this kind of culmination of, of the war. Um, so 
it's a it's worth checking out if you haven't ever gone to the Library of Congress and typed in Grand Review. Um, the images are pretty remarkable. That would be such an amazing site, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And really, we can't necessarily wrap our heads around it because we're looking through it, you know, 21st century lens, right. but that's amazing. Um, so who was allowed to be part of the Grand Review? Were there USCT soldiers? Were native soldiers allowed? Was there any restrictions in that regard? So the the kind of funny thing about the Grand Review for as sort of massive an event as it is, about uh, there was less than a week of planning that went into it. So it was really um, kind of an off the cuff event. Um, we actually have letters from William Tecumseh Sherman who was never shy about giving his opinion, you know, being really, really upset, saying, nobody told me this was happening. Like, and now I have to, you know, be here and be ready for this um, because they didn't know it was going to come together. Um, initially, Edwin Stanton, who's the Secretary of War, wants every single U.S. soldier to get to Washington, and that just wasn't feasible um, in terms of where troops were. So they used the troops that they have nearest by, which are Sherman's army and, um, and Grant's army. The Army of the James is close by, and the Army of the James is where a lot of the USCT units are. So they are, um, you know, the African American regiments, and that army isn't actually um, invited to participate in the review because by the time the review comes together, they're already basically on transports to Texas. And this is because um, USCT soldiers didn't start to enlist until after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and they've enlisted for a three year term. So the federal government still has a credible claim to their service. And there's a threat in Mexico of maybe a French uprising against the Benito Juarez government. And so a lot of those troops are sent to Mexico um, under Philip Sheridan, who was super excited to participate in the review and was told at the last second, you have to go to Texas. So Sheridan's also someone who's sort of excluded. Um, and he's someone we think of now as kind of this, one of the big three in the triumvirate of great kind of civil war um, Union military commanders. He's also, you know, said, we need you more in Texas. And so he goes to Texas. Um, and a lot of those UCT units who end up going are sort of really happy that they're being trusted by the government to continue in this military service. So on the one hand, they're not super upset that they're being, you know, sent to Texas because it is a kind of expression of faith on the part of the government and their military ability um, at the end of the war. But in the kind of literature that has followed, it's become a kind of point of contention to say, was this on purpose? No, it was both a quirk of military law um, and also just the fact that there wasn't actually a lot of planning that went into it. Um, and The Liberator, which is a great source on this, William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, puts any kind of... Um, you know, thought about that to bed, they say that the federal government would never have purposely excluded these soldiers because their service is seen, you know, equally as valuable. They, you know, gave the ultimate sacrifice. This is why Frederick Douglass wants USCT soldiers, you know, to take up arms because there's no more credible claim to citizenship than putting on a uniform and fighting for your country. So the abolitionist press denies that there's any kind of purposeful suppression of USCT participation and there is some African-American participation in the form of black pioneers who are with Sherman's army. So there's a whole retinue that comes with Sherman, which I think we'll, we'll come to in a little bit, but there are um, African-American pioneers um, with Sherman who are off commentated upon. Um, as for Native American uh, soldiers, it's a little more difficult to track down. Sometimes Native troops were um, with USCT units. They were considered part of those colored units. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there was certainly at least one company of Native American soldiers who would have been at the Grand Review, and that's Company K of the First Michigan Sharpshooters, who are um, Anishinaabe uh, 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 natives um, who were in, in the Petersburg campaign and then would have been with the Army of the Potomac um, during the um, Grand Review. So they would have been there, as well as Ely Parker who's probably the most famous sort of Union Native American participant in the war. And again, if you, if you look at those phenomenal photographs of the reviewing stand, on both days, Parker's very prominently placed next to the presidential cabinet and Grant. So he's a, he's a very prominent figure in the people taking in the review. So he certainly um, was there. And then again, it was 
the men of the Army of the Potomac and the armies of the Tennessee, or Army of uh, Tennessee and Georgia, who were participating in the review. We talked about this event being over two days with the Army of the Potomac, the Eastern Army, the Eastern mm -hmm. Theater Army, and Sherman's Army, the Western Army, of which, um, you know, when we, we talk about our museum here, most of the troops that would have served out of the Upper Midwest would have served in the Western Army, west of the Appalachian. Can you talk about the difference that those two armies presented during the Grand Review, either through their general appearance or how they marched? Sure. Um, it's it's a, sort of a trope, or if you want to call it that, that uh, observers are obsessed with. And the soldiers themselves are also very committed to either being Sherman's men or, or you know, uh, Eastern um, soldiers. So um, the Eastern Army is seen as very polished. They're kind of seen as almost dandyish. Their bayonets are shined within an inch of their life. They're very much in order. Um, the kind of biggest event on the first day of the march is when Custer loses control of his horse right in front of, conveniently, in front of the presidential reviewing stand and then has to perform some acrobatics to get it under control. Um, you know, that's the kind of biggest chuckle that anyone gets on the first day. Otherwise, it's sort of very polished, very professional. This is the Eastern Army, the Army of the Potomac. Um, the next day, the Western troops cut a very different experience. They're rougher but also they're described as bigger, more soldierly. They're more sort of manly. If you look at Walt Whitman's diaries um, of the Grand Review, he was there, you know, in the hospitals around Washington. He said the Army of the Potomac's fine, but he's incredibly impressed by these um, Western soldiers. And I think part of what's going on is that no one had seen these troops. You know, I think that the, the people of Washington and the East Coast who could get to the Review, they'd seen the Eastern armies. They were sort of more familiar, but um, these Westerners are seen as kind of a different um, type of soldier who had seen a very different type of war. These were the men who had marched across Georgia and the Carolinas. Um, they're seen as kind of hardier, tougher soldiers. And the Western men are very, very proud of that. So, you know, numerous accounts of them saying, you know, how, how much better they looked than the Eastern soldiers and how much more appreciated uh, they were by the crowds who were much more interested in seeing the Western troops than, than the Eastern troops. And they also did kind of bring this retinue with them, which I think um, kind of helped their cause in the public imagination. They had the black pioneers that had been with their army. Um, and by pioneers, these are, you know, people who would help dig trenches, set up camps, you know, do all the kind of work to support an army. And they're kind of allowed to come along with, uh, with the soldiers. They're also, they have mules with them, chickens, things that they had liberated from, you know, the plantations of the South. The newspapers, you know, constantly saying, well, that was Jefferson Davis's mule. They stole it from his, you know, plantation in, in Mississippi or, you know, whatever. So I think people are much more kind of fascinated and enthralled with the Eastern soldiers um, who, who do just present a very different experience and they had, they had lived a different war. So I think again, another great thing about the Grand Review as an event is it gets at those kind of different experiences that um, until Grant comes you know, to take command of the Army of the Potomac, they had been a, a fairly beaten down bunch of guys. So they hadn't, seen a lot of victory, a lot of success, and it's a, it's a Westerner that turns the war around uh, in the East, versus these Western armies are almost never not victorious. There's a kind of brief moment at Chickamauga where Braxton Bragg, of all people, gets the better of them, but other than that, they're, they're winners, and they know that, and the people watching them know that. So it's a very um, confident, I would say, display by those, those Western troops, and, and much appreciated, I think they're much more lauded. Um, you know, the coverage is just fawning over these Western guys. So it's, it's, it's cool to see, especially if you have kind of an affinity for, uh, for those Western troops and those units, um, you know, or, or if you're tired of the East Coast bias for the Civil War, I think, uh, you know, Civil War Americans very much, um, they focused on what was going on between the two capitals, but they really wanted to know about about what was going on in the West too. And that's where Union victories were coming from for most of the war. So they're really treated as heroes um, and, and presented that way in the newspapers and you know accounts of the parade. I love the idea of them with the mules and chickens and 
what a sight, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, pe and people were just, I mean, they loved it. Um, you know, they comment most about that kind of animals and then there are wagons of wounded that are being pulled, you know, through, um, so that those soldiers aren't excluded. Um, Marianne Bickerdyke, who's the one woman that we know was able to march in the review, gets a lot of commentary. Custer and his horse. Um, there's these kind of moments that, you know, every account touches on, but every single one of them, um, the retinue falling the Western troops is everyone's favorite. Mother Bickerdyke is covered in our museum too. Good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and I actually had a participant from one of my other programs talk about her because she's from her hometown. So very cool. Um, so talking about military parades and it's, it's interesting because there's a long history of military parades, right? Dating back to ancient Rome. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of these military parades and how their history stretches back so far? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I started working on the Grand View as an undergraduate um, at the University of Virginia for, um, uh, for my sort of senior thesis. And I was really fortunate to not just have great Civil War historians as teachers there, but also sort of ancient and, and medieval historians. So um, being a people pleaser, I think I wanted to do a project that would kind of touch on all these things uh, I was interested in. And as I started to read more about the Grand Review, it struck me that people constantly said, this is like ancient Rome. This is like ancient Rome, sort of over and over, um, because, you know, we have to kind of cast ourselves back to antebellum or Civil War, mid-19th century America. These were people who knew and understood kind of references to the kind of classical past uh, with kind of greater fluency than, you know, the average person might today. They they certainly were, were well-versed in that kind of that history, and it surrounded them um, from the era of the founding to the architecture in the national capital. I mean, this kind of affinity with with Rome and then the United States Army has always this kind of especially in the 19th century an affinity with Napoleon and the, the Napoleonic Wars and the French Army and of course Napoleon's great model is kind of Charlemagne and then sort of beyond that ancient Rome so there's this kind of thread of all these things together so observers mention Napoleon they mention the Roman triumph which is um, kind of one of these remarkable ceremonies that we know about which was predominantly you know used in the roman republic so the pre um pre-imperial period of rome um, which was for any general who was victorious in a war and came back to rome and stopped outside the city gates there weren't soldiers allowed in the city um, and asked the senate to be awarded a triumph so that his men could be celebrated and that he could be celebrated as a great victor so the Roman triumph is a very prescribed ceremony. There's a set route it has to take and certain things has to ha have to happen. So the general has to be in a chariot, pulled by four white horses, attended by servants. He gets to kind of dress in the attire of a god for the day. Um, so it's it's very, like picture Ulysses as Grant, like just like strolling, <laughs> you know, like rolling down uh, Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue in like a crown, um, and which I'll sort of come back to, which is is that, there's certain things that happen. So there's giant placards that are held up depicting events from the campaign. Um, and then there are captured prisoners um, from the enemies that the Romans have been fighting who are pulled in cages. Um, and oftentimes at the end of the review sacrificed um, in the kind of the temple. Uh, and there are spoils from the campaign. So again, any money that they had brought back and kind of all these kind of things. So what it's really designed to do is to say, here's what happened that ye, none of you, the citizens of Rome, saw. So it's designed to close that distance between the battlefield and the city. So they're fighting for Rome, and now they're bringing back their victory and kind of trying to make it real for Romans who wouldn't have had the experience of the campaign or the battle. Um, and it's a ceremony that gets kind of replicated in, you know, Carolingian times, and then Napoleon really seizes upon it as a great kind of military gesture. So the Arc de Triomphe is very much uh, sort of an imperial 
um, triumphal monument to exactly that kind of thinking, depicting these images of war um, for people who didn't get to experience them. Um, but the most important thing to know about uh, Roman triumph is that you can't have a triumph for a civil war. And so that's a, a really important fact if you're going to compare it to um, what happens in the United States, which is this great victory parade, because Romans believe that civil wars made them look weak in the eyes of their enemies, in the eyes of their rivals. Um, Romans fighting against Romans demonstrated internal weakness. And so when Caesar comes back after the civil war, he asks for a triumph, but not over Pompey and his legions. He asks for a triumph over some of the other allies that had been fighting with Pompey. So it's really important they, they use this kind of rhetorical trick to convince themselves that that's not what they're doing. But all the kind of Roman observers say, Caesar knew exactly what he was doing and he shouldn't have been given this triumph. It was sort of a, it was in bad faith. It was, you know, not the right thing um, because civil wars did destroy Rome. And so people writing, you know, about it say, um, you know, this celebration of civil strife is not something we want to um, really focus on because this is what tore our, Republic apart, um, toward asunder. And of course, um, this is on the minds of Civil War Americans. Like they know how risky a civil war can be. And they also know what the United States and the Union, like capital U Union means to people in Europe and the world over because it's a democratic experiment that's succeeding and secession threatens all of that. And so to have a victory parade is something of a risk. Um, and so I got really interested in the question of why they would do it, um, because they clearly understood the reference and they understood the ceremony and the tradition. Um, and I think they're really trying to say, we survived the Civil War. I think what the Grand Review is trying to project is, is a sense of survival, that, that the Civil War didn't tear us apart, that the Union is victorious and it's going to come back together. They don't stop to reflect about how former Confederates are going to feel about it. And in fact, I, I looked day and night in Confederate newspapers to try and figure out if they had commented on this giant parade, and I couldn't find anything. It's really remarkable. It just kind of um, passes by um, this kind of defeated populace, and maybe they're focusing on, on other things at that point. It's certainly very understandable. But I think what Civil War Americans are trying to do is say, we understand what was going on in ancient Rome. They clearly do. Um, but we're different from that because we survived the civil war and we're going to go forward as a much sort of stronger nation with our union intact. Our Republic survived civil strife and that's what makes us different. So it's really important to them that they're part of this tradition, but they also very clearly rhetorically set themselves apart from these, these ancient ceremonies and parades. And then in the years that follow the grand review, they reenact the parade and try and sort of keep that message going. So in um, 1892, there's a reenactment in Washington of the Grand Review in which USCT troops participate, it's sponsored by the GAR. And then in 1915, um, there's a kind of, <laughs> there's very few veterans left, but they have it again. But again, kind of in the coverage and the speeches and what they're saying, and Woodrow Wilson speaks of that one, you know, they talk about the union surviving. So it's a way for them to really inscribe union survival, union victory um, as, a, as a really important meaning of the war. And they get in early, right? Like this is one of the first kind of memorial events uh, for veterans who are about to go home. They kind of march out of Washington and, and onto to rail cars and then home to their communities. Um, but it's really, it shows you how important this idea of union was to them and how much they were thinking about it and then how much we've lost that, you know? So what I kind of wrote about in my article about their view is that persistence of union memory for the wartime generation that we really lose, but that you see, you know, if you compare these traditions of victory parades, how, how the grand review is set apart, um, I call it a victory over history. I think they really viewed it as that. They viewed it as a, as a statement of their kind of superiority over these, these kind of great republics that had that had failed to survive exactly what they had just come through. It was just when you were speaking, um, we're putting together a new exhibit that's going to open in December on immigrant soldiers who served in the Union Army. 
And one of the collections we have is a, a, a soldier from Racine, Wisconsin. And Racine is about 10 miles north of Kenosha. And in that collection, there are numerous ribbons, GAR ribbons and WRC ribbons from 1915. Mm -hmm. So at that review, that 50th anniversary, yeah, it yeah. didn't strike me until you were talking about, and, and I think both he and his wife went because the Women's Relief Corps was certainly an auxiliary to the GAR, and many of the ribbons are WRC ribbons along mm -hmm. with, he was a Wisconsin delegate for that event. And I just assumed it was just another um, GAR, um, you know, annual reunion, right. annual encampment. But when you mentioned that, it, it hit me that that was the 50th anniversary of the uh, Grand Review. And so that's why that immigrant mm -hmm. from Racine took the time to go out to yeah. participate. At that time, he would have been, she's 71 years old. So yeah, it was a yeah. big deal. And there are, there are photographs of it. And there's some of the, like, the veterans wear their uniforms from 1965 and they're very, like, prideful about it. But the newspaper coverage is really sweet because it's like, some of them only made it half a mile and then they had to get in, in a, you know, a carriage or whatever. But they want them to, they want to carry them the whole way. So there's, like, all this support structure to make sure that the men, even though they're older or, you know, you know, have, you know, impediments that they can participate. It's it's really, you know, it just shows um, how much these veterans meant to people that they would, you know, be given the stage to do this um, 50 years later. Yeah. You mentioned some resources earlier for people to learn more about the Grand Review. Can you, um, can you give us a few more? Let, let, let us know where we can get more information on this event that might be some, the one Civil War event that kind of flies under the radar for some people. Yeah, it really does. There's no full length book about it. So, um, you know, there's historians have written about it in different contexts. So um, Gary Gallagher writes about it in context of union in a book called The Union War. Um, Brian Matthew Jordan has written about it in terms of kind of veterans and trauma and the kind of psychology of the end of the war in his book Marching Home. Those are two kind of good places to get two different takes on the review and scholarly books. Um, other than that, you know, it's really, if you want to get a taste of the review, you should go to uh, Grant's memoirs or Sherman's memoirs, phenomenal accounts of the parade. You can't look at Sheridan's. He was, wasn't there. Um, but Union regimentals too. So if you're curious about, you know, your ancestors regiment or the, you know, regiment, you know, from your area, if they were there, find their regimental history. And a lot of these are on, you know, uh, Hayati Trust now. So it's great. Um, you just, you go to the end. That's the nice thing about research and great reviews. <laughs> you, know, you just see it go to the last few pages. Um, but they often have great accounts of their unit's participation. And you can get little details there. And then again, the Library of Congress, I think one of the great things about the review is how, um, you know, heavily photographed it was. So, you know, Library of Congress, Prints and Photographs Division, and, you know, download the highest you know, quality TIFF file you can. And they're amazing because you can zoom in so, so far. And I mean, you can, you can see like Sherman roll, like practically rolling his eyes, at, you know, something, you know, Stanton said next to him. They, they, they didn't get along. Um, so it's really, really cool. Um, so that is those kind of digital resources, Library of Congress, and then, you know, um, soldier accounts, a uh, soldier who served through the war with the Army of the Potomac, almost certainly would have, you know, some account of it. Um, and, and Sherman and Grant both have great descriptions. And, and it should be noted that uh, even Grant, who had led the Army of the Potomac to defeating Robert e. Lee, talks more about the Western soldiers and how proud he is of them. Because they're his guides. I mean, they're really his guides, you know, from the beginning. So even even Grant, who's like associated with the Army of the Potomac during the parade, is he's talking about the Western soldiers too. So those are some great you know places to to start. Um, I've I think there may be a book in the works, uh, not um, by me, but uh, you know my article was in Civil War history in March of 2020. Um, if you really want to know more about the Roman, um, you know, kind of stuff aspect. But other than that, yeah, I think primary sources are still the place to go for this event because it, it is under the radar and, and not really treated by, by scholars. So um, lots of work, I think, lots of potential to, to keep writing about it and talking about it. Um, and it's meaning, you know, today, um, we all know, you know, I think there hasn't really been a similar event. Uh, there was, you know, ticker tape parade after, um, 
World War II in New York. Um, Dewey's fleet sails up um, the East River after the Spanish-American War by the Grant Memorial. Um, and then there was a big parade in Washington after the first Gulf War, which a lot of people, some people remember and other people don't. Um, but it's not really an event we've replicated. Uh, the current president sometimes talks about these great military displays. And I think there's room for kind of reevaluating what that means to us as a society and what it means to our military and, and, and that kind of culture. So plenty of room for, for work to continue on the parade. Yeah, it, it definitely like flies under the radar. I know one of the biggest kind of reintroductions to it was I read about Company K recently and they, marched so they were mentioned yeah. but we're really glad that you could join us today so no, thank you so no. much we learned a lot about the grand review um so thank you so much Cecily sure. we have you yeah thank you guys thanks so much for all you're doing <laughs> thank yeah. you and thank you everybody for watching we'll see you next time